Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. One of the most remarkable natural habitats in the world is located here on the Aleutian Island chain of Alaska, our largest state. In this area, on land, on the water surface, and below, live a variety of animal species especially adapted to life on and around these austere islands. Some of these include the puffin, a marvelous bird which swims, dives, and flies with equal facility. The stellar sea lion, which breeds on these islands in abundance. And two of the most important fisheries resources of Alaska, the humpback salmon, which returns to the streams here to spawn, and the king crab, which inhabits a rocky underwater domain. Recently, we were invited by the Alaska Fish and Game Department to observe above water and below the stellar sea lions, the spawning salmon, and the department's research on the king crab. Today's story begins as we arrive by helicopter at Baby Isles, an area the Aleut Indians call where the winds are born. There are few places in this area where safe landings can be made. But our skilled helicopter pilot, Jack Davidson, knows that Priest Rock up ahead is where we will make our turn inland to our landing place. Expecting the islands to be little more than bleak and barren rock, one is pleasantly surprised at the emerald green cloaking the rugged slopes. The growing season here is very short, only about three months, and we're fortunate to have arrived in August at its peak. We've gone inland now along the Shiznikov River to a place where our landing is to be made. Landing in the tall grass could be hazardous because of large rocks which might be hidden from view. But here beside the river is a clearing just pretty for us. I'll get out here and follow the branch of the river going to the right. The grasses and colorful fireweed are remarkably tall considering the brevity of the growing season. Before heading for the rendezvous, there's time to observe some of the wildlife. The icy stream bisecting this meadow provides the first opportunity for that since it's presently alive with spawning salmon. Already, they're hovering over small territories which they've claimed on the bottom. These are humpback salmon, the name deriving from the male's distinctive hump at this season. The female is clearing her spawning bed, and before long, she'll begin laying her eggs. As soon as that occurs, the male who is waiting close by will fertilize them. His hooked snout becomes pronounced at this time. These humpback salmon have returned to this river and probably to the very branch of the river where they themselves were hatched. From here, they began their journey to the sea. Now they've returned. It's a remarkable example of instinctive homing. One of the most colorful of Baby Isle's inhabitants occupies this island in great numbers. It's that permanent resident seabird, the puffin, which nests in burrows it digs. Streamlined and compact, it engages in no extensive migration. Puffins fly and swim with great skill and feed primarily on small fish which they catch. There's one other major species here that I want to see before getting to the rendezvous. It's hard to believe in view of this lush green growth that in only a month, winter will return to this area.
the largest mammal on the island is the stellar sea lion. These animals are year-round residents which breed and raise their young on these rugged shores. Climbing rocks can be hazardous, but the pups are relatively safe from natural enemies. A large sea lion may weigh over a ton. Aware of my presence, they're alert but unafraid. These sea lions range as far as the Bering Sea for food, but they don't really migrate as seals do. Females weigh up to 800 pounds, and pups are over 40 pounds at birth. Breeding season is past, but some territorial aggression remains. Such fights now between the bulls are few and brief. Sea lions propel themselves in swimming with powerful webbed flippers, but this is a lazy time of year for them, and mostly they're content to just merely bask on shore and engage in essentially non-strenuous activities, seemingly with much enjoyment. Before long, colder weather will begin to make them more active. Remarkably agile in the water, Sometimes they enter the sea in a manner which is really breathtaking to observe. This is especially true when they leave the higher rocks. Unfortunately, it's time for me to leave. It would be very easy to tarry here longer and watch the sea lions come back out of the sea and resume their places on the rocks. Along the river below that waterfall is where I'm to meet an expert scuba diver. The waterfall has no name. The river below it flows in a very short distance into the sea. As previously arranged, Jim Foley is waiting for me here just below the falls, and together we'll move down to the shore. From there, we will subsequently be taken to the ship, which is now just moving into position. It's the 108-foot King Crabber called the Katie K, now a research ship. There we'll observe the king crab conservation and management work being done by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Shortly after Jim Foley and I met near the waterfall, we were joined by a biologist of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game who is in charge of the king crab research being done in these Aleutian waters. The 140-ton KTK has anchored and sent a boat ashore for us. Paul Tate is the area shellfish biologist for the Aleutians and Bering Sea. His responsibility in these waters includes the extremely important king crab fisheries, which are so vital to Alaska's economy. The research in which he is engaged, as we will soon be seeing, determines the size and the number of the crabs which can be taken in these waters. This ongoing research program ensures that Alaskan waters will always have a viable population of king crabs. Before heading out to the KTK, Paul is going to take us on a brief tour parallel with the rugged shoreline of Baby Isles. This will give us an opportunity to see the area where the main population of the stellar sea lions is always found. Sometimes when startled, the sea lions will plunge away, but for the most part they are merely curious about us and not terribly nervous. The sea lions here are protected by law and may not be hunted except by native tribes. 
and then never commercially, but only for subsistence. Now we'll head out to the ship to observe the research work being done on king crabs. The KTK is ideal for the research since she was built specifically for king crab fishing. The importance of the research work done by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game aboard this vessel cannot be too strongly stressed. 70 million pounds of king crabs are harvested annually throughout the Bering Sea with the controls that are being established with this research. If controls were not set, that number might be two or three times higher, and a perpetuating brood stock would be destroyed, meaning that almost certainly the king crab would face extinction. This deck area is where most of the work with king crabs is done by Paul Tate and his men. The traps we use in our work here are checked every other day. There are 300 traps marked by numbered floats which ride on the surface above them. Because the traps are very heavy, it's necessary to haul them in with a special winching apparatus. Mostly our traps are placed on the bottom, in water 40 to 80 feet deep. Because of the considerable weight of the trap, and the way it has to be brought aboard, the men have to act as a team. Although the crab trap is of wire mesh, it's properly called a pot. Our crab pots are baited with chopped up herring, and the average catch for each raising of the trap is about 30 king crabs. These are mostly red king crabs in this pot, but there are other species too. Our pots have a much smaller mesh than those that are used by commercial crabbers, so that we can catch species other than crabs to study, including squid, snails, fish, and so forth. The crabs are first separated by sex and by whether or not they've molted this year. A non-molted shell is worn and dirty green. Sexing them is not difficult. The males, such as the one I'm holding now, don't have an abdominal flap as is found on the belly of the females, like this one Marlin had. About a quarter million eggs are carried by the female for 11 months before hatching. Once they're sexed, we take them to a nearby area where they're placed in temporary holding bins. Minimum size for harvesting is six and a half inches. And measurement is made with a caliper on the top shell or carapace. My assistant, Bob Nelson, finds this crab a legal sized sexually mature male. He attaches a tag through a particular cartilage which is not lost when all the hard parts are molted. Only a random sampling of about 1,500 male crabs are tagged annually, and the percentage recovered provides an accurate total harvest estimate. Fisheries technician John Lesh calls out the measurements of released crabs not tagged, and this information is also carefully logged for our data bank, helping us to establish sound harvesting regulations. I'll go now with Bob Nelson to observe the next phase of study of the king crabs, the migration of adult males to deeper water. Aboard the KDK, Jim Foley and Bob Nelson are now in their wetsuits, 
prepared to dive in the icy waters to observe the annual migration of the male king crabs on the bottom. Below me on the diving deck, both men are ready. Bob Nelson is first off, and Jim Foley with a flashlight follows. The water is very cold, but Bob Nelson and I are well protected from the chill by our special extra thick wetsuits. We've reached a depth of 35 feet and will gradually follow the bottom toward deeper water in our search for migrating crabs. Bob has discovered the species of starfish called sun star, which has about 20 arms instead of the usual five. Sun stars prey upon clams and other mollusks, as do king crabs. So, to a certain extent, they're competitors for the same food. However, king crabs also prey on these sun stars. Sun star sticks tenaciously to almost anything, as Bob discovers. In our continuing search for the migrating king crabs, we've now entered an area of kelp seaweed. Individual kelp strands may reach a length of 40 or 50 feet, or even more. Some of these long fronds are stretching all the way up to the surface above us. Within a few moments, we encounter, swimming very gracefully among the fronds, some stellar sea lions. They don't seem to mind our presence, and we're certainly not bothered by them. We would really enjoy being able to watch them longer, but our underwater time is shortened by the coldness of the water, and we must continue the search. We finally locate them. The migrating king crabs are swarming along the bottom here by the thousands. Only older males migrate, leaving the females and small males in the shallower waters as they head for depths of as much as 700 feet to feed on snails and clams. When a king crab hatches, usually in late April or early May, it leaves the female as a free-swimming larva, which doesn't resemble an adult. Not until two months have passed does it assume the ordinary king crab shape, and it is never again able to swim. Instead, it walks along the bottom. Crabs can move most rapidly sideways, and that's how they go when startled. Most adult male king crabs measure about 7 inches across the carapace and weigh about 10 pounds. Maximum size, however, is 18 pounds. The small pincers, though usually used merely to threaten with, can deliver a painful nip if necessary. Our air supply is now nearly depleted, and when I signal to Bob Nelson, he's quick to agree that we should head for the surface. With Jim and Bob safely returned, our observations are all but completed in this remote island habitat of the far north. 
The Aleutian Islands are not just a string of rocks barren of life in an icy sea. They are the habitat of many animals, on shore and in the water. They are the islands which the natives describe as being the place where the winds are born. The wildlife resources of coastal Alaska are important both economically and aesthetically. The inherent bleakness of these islands is tempered by the movements and color of the puffins as they move about on shore, and by the frolicking of harbor seals and sea lions in the surrounding waters. The value of the salmon and the king crabs is clearly apparent, and the studies made allow them to be utilized to man's benefit without the risk of decimation. The activities of the Alaska Fish and Game Department provide an excellent example of wildlife management. Through their efforts, although wildlife resources are harvested, they are not abused, and the wildlife here exists as a healthy, valuable portion of the wild kingdom.